Meanwhile, in North Dakota, jury selection begins Monday in our next live trial. The defendant, Nikki Ensel, is accused of conspiring to kill her husband and then trying to cover up the murder by setting her house on fire. Prosecutors claim Ensel did not act alone and was motivated by love and money. We'll bring you the opening statements live on Tuesday. That's the schedule at this point. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae is covering the case for us and has a look at the case against the defendant. Nikki Sue Ensel called 911 at 5.25 p.m. on January 2nd, 2020. Her house was on fire. But there was more to it. Firefighters discovered someone in the bed, in the master bedroom, and a propane heater nearby. It was the body of 42-year-old Chad Enzel, Nikki's husband. Chad was a little league coach who was well known in the local car racing world, a hobby his family says made him truly happy. Investigators say he died from a gunshot wound to the head. Five days later, police arrested Nikki Enzel and charged her with conspiring to commit murder and arson. Good morning. Court will open the record in the state of North Dakota versus Nikki Sue Melissa Ensel. But police say Nikki had help, a partner in crime that was also her alleged lover, Earl Howard. Police say they used surveillance video to piece together what they believe was a love triangle that ended in murder. They say the pair shot and killed Chad, and then days later lit the house on fire to destroy any evidence. Police claim the lovers plotted the murder to continue their affair and paved the way for Nikki to collect on her husband's insurance policy. In February, a surprise twist came to their secret romance. Howard pleaded guilty to his role in Chad's murder and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. But Nikki Ansel maintains her innocence she says she was estranged from her husband and was staying at this hotel. According to court documents, Nikki claims her husband was killed in a confrontation with Howard and that she played no part in his death, explaining she was in another room when it happened. Now a jury will decide whether Howard and Nikki were not just lovers, but co-conspirators. Nikki is charged with conspiracy to commit murder and arson in her husband's death. If she's convicted, she faces life in prison. Let's bring back Karen Felicia Nance. She's in San Francisco, criminal defense attorney. And the charge here is the conspiracy to commit murder and arson, which gives the state that leeway of, okay, maybe she didn't pull the trigger because they don't obviously have the evidence needed for, um, for that charge. Um, but the penalty is life. So uh, the stakes are very high for her. What are you expecting in this case in terms of a defense? Well, the defense obviously is going to be that uh, Earl Howard was the one that uh, planned it alone because of his relationship with her. And therefore she had no idea because she was obviously staying at this uh, apart, um, at this hotel at the time. I think the difficulty comes in is the jury buying it because who's to benefit from the insurance policy, but, but, but the white. And so I think that that's gonna be a difficult uh, uh, to overcome and most probably in this particular case it would require her to testify to get that story out i don't think that there was any offer to earl howard in terms of the plea deal uh, um, whether he had to testify I, I didn't have any information with regarding that so it'll be interesting to see if he's called to the witness stand but i think in order for her to prevail with a not guilty verdict um, i think that she's going to have to explain the situation and why she's saying that she was not at the home at the time and nor was she aware that her um, the person she's having the affair with planned this on his own when he had no financial benefit uh, to the death of, of, of uh, Nikki's husband. So it'll be interesting to see this case get started. Love is a powerful drug. Uh, you could argue that the, these two men were fighting over Nikki and she was in the other room and no, oh, had no idea. Now, husband's dead, Earl's there uh, with the gun, and, and she helps him let, light the place on fire. The problem is they, wait, they, they waited to light the place on fire. Um, so now it, it, does, it, it makes it very difficult. The story that she has to tell is going to be interesting, that's for sure, and, and we'll be all watching it along to it. The other part of the, the other component to this is that this was supposed to go to trial back in February, but her attorney 
bailed at the last second in the 11th hour and, and told the judge, we can't do this anymore, um, and, and was allowed to be removed from the case. He's a public defender assigned to the case. Take a listen to the back and forth with the judge uh, during a Zoom hearing uh, on this point. Are, I am filing a motion to withdraw in this particular case, and, and I'll explain to the court uh, briefly without breaking any attorney-client privilege, but um, at this point, I, I know we're late in the game, and I wouldn't be filing a motion to withdraw if I didn't feel it was absolutely necessary at this point. But there's been a, a breakdown in the attorney-client relationship at this point, which I believe leaves me no option but to withdraw. Okay, Ms. Ensel, have you discussed this with your attorney? And I don't want to know about any conversations, but did you know he would be filing that? Okay, okay I need a verbal response, please. Yeah. And do you have an objection to him withdrawing and another attorney being appointed? No, I don't. Do you understand that if he withdraws, a trial won't proceed next week? And to get it rescheduled, we're probably talking at least six months because I have to, you know, block off two more weeks. Yes, I do. Karen, what's your, um, what comes to mind when you, when you hear this back and forth at the 11th hour? A lot of clients are difficult um, and public defenders deal with it all the time. A lot, and most times judges say, sorry, you're, we're going to trial. It's next week. Absolutely, and, and I was a public defender here in the San Francisco Bay Area for, for about 10 years, and it was really discouraged in the office to make that type of motion to re request a withdrawal because it just sets a bad precedent. Once the word gets out that you can just fire your attorney at any point in time, then, then other clients make that same plea, especially when you have an attorney that's been appointed by the court and that you couldn't afford to, to hire your own attorney. And so I'm surprised, I don't know what the practice is in this particular county, but it was really discouraged in the county I practiced in for that reason. You don't want people to, defendants to fire willy nilly. And it prolongs the court process. And that may be the reason, but I think that um, ethically, the, the attorney's making a representation to the court that there is a breakdown of communication now, how that's going to affect the next attorney that's going to be appointed, most probably someone from a court-appointed panel or from the public defender's office uh, itself may select an attorney, but she's not saying that she wants to represent herself, so she's entitled to have counsel. Either that's going to be from the same office that this gentleman's from, or there may, might be like a court-appointed panel where she could uh, obtain counsel in another way. So. Uh, maybe the prolonging is going to help um, her case in terms of um, witnesses' memories fade or that type of thing. But um, I, I'm surprised that it was, and we'll never know, right, what the breakdown is because the attorney-client privilege. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when you have a client that's difficult? Well, you try to breathe through it. And uh, I, there are many clients that I had that I preferred not to represent because of the just the uh, uh, disharmony between um, the conversations. It's really hard to have a defendant who is facing such serious charges as, as in this case, the murder case and all the evidence that's there. And they really don't want to listen to uh, your, their attorney explaining the, the negative aspects of the case. And in this case, there are many, you know, we have the, you know, the fire, two fires that were set, he was shot, and the fact that she was going to get um, the, uh, and she was named as a beneficiary on his insurance, her husband's insurance policy. So the biggest problem that I, the biggest obstacle was getting clients to see the reality of the evidence that, that's been presented and making a, an informed decision about what's best for them. They always have, uh, no, it's not that bad. You know, they don't think that the evidence presented uh, or the, that the uh, prosecution is going to prevail. And most of the time, prosecutions do prevail. Prosecutions <laughs> Indeed, prevail. as we watch uh, week by week here at Court TV. Oh, we've had some uh, defendants uh, walk out of courthouses, though. Uh,